light. How would our world look like without light? Light is how we see objects. And it's basically the reflection of light that enables us to see objects. But light has other properties like refraction, diffraction, interference, and so on. There are two ways to study light. This is geometrical optics, where the obstacle size is much greater than the wavelength of light. But in the next chapter, when we deal with objects that are much smaller than the wavelength of light, that will be called, or that is called, wave optics. It's a, a reflection. You see objects like tables and desks and uh, the other objects because of diffuse reflection. Uh, if you look at the diagram, you can see what diffuse reflection is. In this diagram, on top, the surface is rough, and that would be how the surface of a desk would look like through a microscope. And so when parallel rays of light fall on the desk, you see that the reflected rays go off in all directions. And so while you can see the object, you cannot see the image of your face when you really look into uh, the surface of a desk. But on the other hand, if you have a plain mirror, and when you look at that, you see your image because all the rays of light that are incident on it are reflected parallel. So if you place your eye in the correct pos position, we are able to get the image. So those are the two types of uh, reflections. Diffuse reflection from a rough surface and regular reflection from a smooth surface. Whatever be the type of reflection, the laws of reflection have to be obeyed. There are two laws of reflection. Let's take a look. This is the reflecting surface and this is the point of incidence. And we have to draw a perpendicular to that point or at that point to the surface. This is the incident ray, the ray that falls on the surface, making this the angle of incidence. And this is the reflected ray, making this the angle of reflection. And you can see that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So whenever light is reflected from any kind of surface, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. That's the first law. And the second law is that all three, the incident ray, the reflected ray, and the perpendicular drawn to the surface, all three must lie in the same plane. And that's why I'm able to draw it on the screen because they're all in the plane of the screen. These are the laws of reflection. So here is a plane mirror which produces an image of this person right here. We will look at the image in detail later on, but as of now, any image has four properties. One, it could either be a real or virtual. Now a real image can be produced on a screen, projected on a screen. Uh, just like when you watch a movie in the movie theater, that image is being projected on a screen. That's a real image. But the image that you see in the plane mirror, or you think you see, is a virtual image because you cannot project it on a screen. That's a false image, a virtual image. That's number one. Number two, the image is upright. Like the object, the image is also upright not inverted. Number three, both the object and the image have the same size. Number four, the object distance DO, which is the distance of the object from the mirror, is exactly equal to the image distance DI. 
But since the image is behind the mirror, it's going to be negative. So DO is equal to negative DI. So those are the four properties of the image produced by a plane mirror. It's virtual, it's upright, it's of the same size, and the object distance is exactly equal to the image distance, but the image is behind the mirror. The next property of light is refraction. Refraction is the property where, you know, you think the depth of a swimming pool is actually smaller than it is. In fact, if a swimming pool is like four meters deep, from the outside, it will appear to be only three meters deep. That's dangerous. So that is an effect of refraction. But why does refraction happen? Why does now, what is refraction? It's actually the bending of light when light passes from one material into another. So, for example, when light passes through air, it goes in a straight line. But as soon as it hits the surface of water, the light ray bends. All right. So, after it bends, it only bends at the surface and then it continues straight. So, that bending of light when it passes from one material into another is called refraction. And this bending happens because the speed of light is different in different materials. So to illustrate that, think, uh, think about a car being driven suddenly into grass. So from concrete you move into grass, that sudden change in speed is gonna make the car turn. And how much the car turns depends on the type of materials. So if light passes from air into water, it's going to bend. But if it goes from air into glass, it's going to bend a little bit more. So we have to define something called the refractive index, which shows how much light bends. Now, refractive index of any material is the speed of light in air divided by the speed of light in that material. So as an example, the refractive index of glass can be found out by using the formula. The speed in air is 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. Speed in glass is 2 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. So when you divide, you get 1.5. So that's the refractive index of glass. Refractive index has no unit. All right, it's just a ratio. So that means if the refractive index is higher, then the speed of light in that material is, you got it, smaller. So when we talk about diamonds, diamonds have a very high refractive index and so the speed of light in diamonds is really small. And that is why diamond sparkle makes them precious. We'll see that soon. But now let's uh, look at this. Uh, if you look at the fish in an aquarium from the corner, as you can see, the light coming out through the two faces bend and pass into the eye, as you can see in this diagram. And so it will appear that there are two fishes. You're only seeing one fish, but there are two images. So that can be clearly seen here. The incident ray here bends down and this one bends that way. So you see that there. And the important law of refraction is called Snell's law. Snell's law of refraction. N1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. N1, in this case, is the refractive index of water. Theta1 is the angle in water. N2 is the refractive index of air. And theta2 is the angle in air. So make sure that you don't mix them up, okay? So that's why you have the subscripts 1 and 1. And so as an example, if theta1 is 30 degrees in water, uh, what would theta2 be? in the air. Ooh. Unfortunately, I've used glass, the refractive index of glass, so 
said I want is 30 degrees in glass and uh, the light ray is trying to come out into air. So when we use the formula, you get 1.5, that's the refractive index of glass, sine 30 is equal to 1 sine theta 2. 1 is the refractive index of air. So when we do the math, we're going to get sine theta is 0 0.75, and uh, when you take the inverse, you get 48.6 degrees. So we see that the light ray that's coming is actually bending away because the angle theta 2 is bigger than the angle theta 1. So that's a clear illustration of refractive index of light. Now, there is a, a, a wonderful phenomenon called total internal reflection that we use in daily life. So let me explain what total internal reflection is. So consider that light is passing from an optically dense medium to not so dense. So that means, let's say light is passing from water into air. And so it's going to go away. As we saw, theta 2 is going to be bigger than theta 1. We just saw that. So, But you notice that a part of the light is reflected and majority of the light is refracted. But if you increase the angle, keep increasing the angle of incidence, you will see that the refracted ray makes an angle of 90 degrees. So the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. And that happens for a particular value of the angle of incidence. That angle of incidence is called the critical angle. So critical angle is the angle of incidence for which the angle of refraction becomes 90 degrees. Now what happens if you make the angle of incidence greater than the critical angle? Let's take a look. In this diagram, the angle of incidence is slightly greater than the critical angle. And as a result, there is no refracted ray. All of the light is now reflected back into the material. This is called total internal reflection. And so if we use Snell's law, in this particular case, we can get another formula for critical angle. Again, remember n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. And theta 1 in this case is theta c. I just called it the critical angle. And sine 90 is 1. And so n1 sine theta c is n2 times 1. So you don't see that. And then when you rearrange, sine theta c is equal to n2 by n1. Or critical angle is the inverse of n2 by n1. Let's use this to find the uh, critical angle of a particular material. So we want to find the critical angle of glass because that's been our example. And you just we just got the values. So it'll be sine inverse 1 by 1.5. Remember, n2 is the refractive index of air because it's coming out into air. And N1 is the refractive index of glass. So that's 1 by 1.5, which makes theta C 41.8 degrees. 41.8 degrees. Total internal reflection is quite useful. Now we can see that uh, optical fibers, which are used in endoscopy, or in communications works on the principle of total internal reflection. So the idea is that this uh, optic fiber made of a transparent material is so thin that when light enters through one end, it hits at an angle greater than the critical angle. So light is not able to come out into air. It's totally reflected so many times. You can see that it's totally reflected there Again, here, multiple total internal reflections happen, and finally the light comes out through the other end. And this happens even if the optic fiber is bent. So that gives us an opportunity to push an optic fiber 
into the human body where we are able to watch the inside of maybe the intestine or any part. See, so that's the, the, the wonderful application of optic fibers, so which based on which uh, we have the endoscopy, end scope. So light passes out through the end and we use it to get a picture. That's why it's called endoscopy. Now, when we come to diamonds, diamonds are precious because they have a very high refractive index. And the faces of the diamond are carefully cut out in such a way that, you know, when light enters through one face, light enters through one face, and it, now here it tries to come out in the air, but the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, so it's totally reflected. And once again, the same thing happens here. So the light ray is totally internally reflected inside the diamond several times before it comes out through one of the faces. So when you look from outside, it appears as if there is a brilliant source of light inside the diamond. The light rays bounce off inside so many times, giving diamonds uh, that sparkling nature, which makes it really precious. Now we look at refraction through a prism. A prism, you can have it in uh, various sizes and shapes, but basically a prism has four uh, sides and a base. And the prism has a certain angle, which is the angle made between the opposite faces. And so what you see here is a profile of a glass prism. It could be made of any transparent material. And when light is incident on one face of the prism, it uh, bends at this surface and then again at the second surface. And light always emerges out towards the base of the prism. So light is always going to come out bending to the base of the prism. And if white light is passed through a prism, it breaks up into its constituent colors, basically the seven colors, the rainbow colors. Now, why does that happen? It's because the refractive index of each color is different. In fact, the refractive index of violet is bigger than that of red. And so that's why you see violet bending the most and red bending the least. This phenomenon is called dispersion. So dispersion is the breaking up of white light into its constituent colors because of the differences in refractive index. And so here we can see uh, the seven colors in visible light. Uh, that is, you can also see that Violet has the smallest frequency, I mean the smallest wavelength. It's given in nanometers, so violet is about 400 nanometers, while red is about 750 nanometers. So remember, nanometer is 10 to the negative 9. So the wavelengths are really small, but the wavelength of red is almost double the wavelength of violet with all the other colors in between. So those are the wavelengths of the rainbow colors. Talking about rainbow colors, let's uh, find out how a rainbow is produced. So rainbows happen just after it has rained. And so if it has rained on, on the west side and the sun is on the east and you are standing with, the, with your back to the sun, and so you have all those water droplets suspended in the atmosphere and the sun is shining over your head into those water droplets. I hope you got that idea. So the water droplets are in front of you and the sun, is, sun rays are coming from behind. So when the sunlight enters each droplet, it undergoes a refraction here, then total internal refraction here, and then it comes out this way. 
But remember that the refractive index of the colors are different. So when they come out, the colors come out at different angles. So when we watch it, we see the colors distributed. So that's how a rainbow is produced. Now, who has not heard of a lens? You know, I wouldn't have had my sight if I didn't have lenses. And so lenses are very useful, used in telescopes, in microscopes, used for uh, correction of eye defects. Now, what is a lens? A lens is just an ordinary piece of glass. So you can actually draw a circle on a window pane, cut it out, you get a circular piece of glass. But if you hold it this way, the thickness of the glass will be the same all around it, right? So if you just, you know, grind the glass away in such a way that the central part is thicker, so you grind off more at the edges, and the central part is thicker, you will get a convex lens. So in a convex lens, the central part is thick. As you go to the edges, it becomes thinner. In a concave lens, it's the opposite. So you grind off more from the central part, uh, making the center very thin, while the edges become thicker. And these two have totally different properties. You can see that a convex lens is a converging lens. That means if you have a parallel ray or parallel rays of light passing through the lens, after refraction, they all come to focus at one point. So it converges it. That's a converging lens. On the other hand, if the same parallel rays pass through a concave lens, you know, the lens diverges the rays, so they go away and they appear to be coming from this point. So that's very important. So this point is not real. The rays, when you extend it backwards, appear to be coming from that point. And so the focal point of a concave lens is virtual, while the focal point of a convex lens is real. That's a very important difference. So a convex lens is a converging lens. Its focal point is real and positive. A concave lens is a diverging lens. Its focal point is virtual. So its focal length is negative. More on that later. Different people wear different power for correcting their eye defects. What do you mean by power of a lens? Do you know the power that you are wearing? Usually people don't, which is sad. Well, the power of a lens is just the reciprocal of its focal length, but the focal length should be in meters. So power is one by the focal length, when the focal length is taken in meters. And the unit of power is called a diopter. So here's an example, if F is 25 centimeters, all right, first change it in a meter. That's a 0.25 meter. So when you calculate the power, you've got to have the focal length in meters. When you do that, you get one by 0.25, which is four diopter. That's a powerful lens. So that's how you find the power of a lens. Again, so take a look at this picture. There is a diver here looking at a person standing at the edge of this lake or pond or whatever. But as you can see, the ray of light that comes from the person, when it hits the water, it bends and reaches the eye of the diver. But the diver thinks that this ray is coming from straight behind. So, the diver would think that the person was standing higher than where they were actually standing. And in the same way, a ray of light coming from the diver bends. So, the person looking at the diver from outside 
will think that the diver is placed higher than actually she is or he is. So whenever you look at an object underwater, it'll always appear to be higher. Remember I told you that if you look at the base of a swimming pool and try to judge the depth of the swimming pool, you're going to make a mistake because the base of the swimming pool will appear to be higher. So you will estimate the depth of the swimming pool to be less than what it is actually. So there's always real depth and apparent depth. So the real depth is the real depth at which the person is. And the apparent depth is what it appears to be. And refractive index can once again be defined as the ratio of the real depth to the apparent depth. So that's another formula to find the refractive index. Real depth by apparent depth. So that's the third formula for refractive index. Remember, it's the ratio of the speed of light in air to that in the material. Number one. Number two, it's given by Snell's law. N1 sine theta one is equal to N2 sine theta two. And number three, it's a real depth by apparent depth. So for example, if uh, AB, which is the real depth, is four meter, and we can find CD knowing the refractive index of water, which is 1.33. So you just go 1.33 is four divided by X, uh, which is the apparent depth, and you get X to be three meters. So it appears to be about one meter higher than it actually is. So that is a cause of refraction there. Now here we have a camera and the eye of a human being. The diagrams are given side by side to show you that it's exactly the same pattern. So there is, there is a person here whom you like to uh, take a picture of. And inside the camera, there is a convex lens. So the convex lens produces the image of the person, which is actually going to be inverted, you know, inverted image will be produced. But the same thing happens in the case of the eye. Light passes through the cornea here. Actually, light bends when it passes through the cornea. And then it goes through the eye lens, which it, which bends it again. And then you get the image of this person. Again, an inverted image on the retina of the eye. The brain actually re-inverts the image, making it upright. All right. So it's the brain that flips it around, making it upright. So that's how images are produced in a camera and in the eye lens. Calculation-wise, I know this is what you've been waiting for, to calculate. Calculation wise, if you're given the object distance from a lens and the focal length of the lens, you should be able to calculate the image distance. So we have DO, object distance, the focal length, F and DI. And the relation between them is one by DO plus one by DI is equal to one by F, really simple. One over DO plus one over DI is one over F. So look at this diagram. Here is the convex lens, which has its focal point here. So the focal length is uh, 0.5 meter, 0 0.5 meter. The light bulb is the object, and the object is at 0.75 meter. All right, so it's outside the focal point. And to try to draw the image or to get the image, you need at least two rays. The first ray passes right through the center of the lens, and so it does not bend. Any ray passing through the center of the lens will not bend. And the second ray passes through the focal point. So after refraction, it becomes parallel to the axis, see parallel to this axis. And so these two refracted rays actually
converge and meet here, which is where you get the image. So di is 1.50 meter. Let's try to prove that mathematically using this formula. So we're trying to find the value of di. So make one by di the subject. You get one by f minus one by do. f is 0 0.50, do is 0 0.75, and therefore you get one by di is 0 0.67. When you flip it, take the reciprocal of that, you get 1.50 meter. We'll work out more problems in the problems uh, video, but this is a good start. And then you should be thinking about what would happen if this light bulb is kept inside the focal point. Well, we'll look at that. We will see that in that case, the image will be virtual. When the uh, object is outside the focal point, the image is real, like in this case. But if the object is inside the focal point, it's going to be virtual. We're going to look at that in a minute. So here it is. Now the object, which is represented by this arrow, is inside the focal point, very close to the lens. So the first ray is drawn parallel to the axis and it goes through the focal point on the other side okay and the second ray is drawn through the center and it will not bend it just goes through so those are the two rays so once again here is the object and here is the focal point so the object is inside the focal point you can see and here are the two rays one parallel passes through the focal point, second one through the center of the lens goes through without bending. So you see that these two rays are never going to meet each other because they're going to go away from each other. And therefore, if you extend them backwards, straight backwards, they appear to be coming from here. So you see there is an appearance here. It's imagination. That's why this image is virtual. So if a person uh, looks from this side, so if the eye was here, then for that person, the image would appear to be here. Do you see, do you notice a difference that this virtual image is upright? Yes, all virtual images are upright. All real images are inverted. That's a point to be noted. All real images are inverted and all virtual images are upright you got it so there's another uh, point here you you see that the object is small the image is bigger that means it's magnified now what is magnification it is the height ratio of the height of the image to the height of the object so if the object was 3 centimeters and the image was 12 centimeters, 12 by 3, 4 is the magnification. So magnification is HI by HO, but it also could be negative DI by DO. Do not forget the negative there. Negative DI by DO. So there are two formulas for magnification either HI by HO or negative DI by DO. This is once again just uh, showing the focal point of a convex lens, which we looked at before. And so here there are three rays drawn. One and three are parallel. They pass through the focal point. And uh, uh, ray two passes through the center and goes through without bending. So they, they meet at the focal point. That's a convex lens. Or what is it otherwise called? Converging lens. What kind of focal point is this? Is it real or virtual? Hmm. It's real because the rays actually meet. There's no imagination there. Okay. And now here is a concave lens. The concave lens, the formula is the same. It's 1 by DO 
plus 1 by di is equal to 1 by f again. Oh, and this time, if you look carefully, you see that the focal length is negative. Why is it negative? Because the focal point of a concave lens is virtual. So all virtual distances are negative. So the focal point is negative, so the focal length is negative. DO is 7.5, and you should be able to calculate DI as negative 4.29. That means the image is virtual. Why? Because we got it as negative 4.29. This is a simple application of a lens. This is how uh, the the thermometer is inside the letters, the numbers, I mean, are so small, but because the, the material here behaves like a converging lens, it's magnified and you're able to see those real tiny numbers much bigger. So that is an application there. Once again, here we have an image produced by a convex lens, which we looked at before. This is the image by a concave lens. Again, three rays, parallel ray number one, parallel ray number three, they, they just go away from each other and a ray through the center goes through without bending. But did you notice that these three will never meet? So now the imagination works. It appears to be coming from here. That's why we say that the focal point is virtual because we have imagined that it's coming from there. And this is, uh, you know, a reflector used in the headlamps of uh, a car, in the headlamp has a reflector. So you have the bulb there, you have a tiny concave mirror here that reflects the light onto this, and then from there onto this big concave mirror, so this is a concave mirror. Remember, it's not a lens, it's a mirror. So now that's reflection and then you get a parallel beam of light that illuminates the objects on the roadside on a dark night and you're able to see it. So mirrors work using reflection. Here is a concave mirror. So the inside part of the mirror is reflected. So we had a plane mirror, now we have a concave mirror. And a concave mirror is converging. A concave mirror is converging. So you see that the key is the object and here is the image. Can you tell me whether it's real or inverted? Hmm. I mean, real or virtual, I meant to ask you real or virtual, and I gave the answer out because the image is inverted, as you can see. If the image is inverted, it's a real image. So a concave mirror produces a real image, okay? So when we work out problems in the next video, I'll go into more details about the calculations and when it's more positive and when it's negative and all that stuff. So this chapter, uh, has a lot of concepts and basically we looked at reflection and refraction so be sure to watch the video on how I worked out the problems in this chapter thank you and remember to share the video to like it and to post a comment thank you for doing that